as though I have conquered death. I live death every day. I am surrounded by it. Smothered by it. My wife, she's missing. I fear terribly for her safety. Some women are just looking for a reason to go missing. She disappeared into the Ahedar desert, the heart of the Whispering Waste. The suicides go, it has an exotic appeal. I fear she has returned to my former mansion. If you would track her, find her, bring her home, you'd pay me in sad looks and liquor. The mansion was never reclaimed by the tax collectors. Dark rumors swirl amid the whispering winds. Landlimiathans marooned amid the dunes in cataclysms past. If my vault is untouched, its entire contents, the wealth of five noble generations, are yours. You had your openers and closers reversed. I should warn you, Sir Thief, or Nachtin, the boards call it. The dead citadel. Worse still, the whispering wastes do not lie empty. Rumors swirl of a figure stooped and shrouded in grey, face hidden, dragging a silver blade at his side, carving his way to the criminal element of two entire countries. None have divined its purpose, and it is only ever spoken one word, one most would not even recognize as a name.
Ghost Sparrow, does this word not sound like the death bird culling the living dead at dawn? It is the name both ghouls and demons dare not say, for they know it means death for the undead. What is up, everybody? How are you doing? What the heck is even going on? I don't know. Uh, I'm just here painting, and I'm working on uh, painting the birth of evil in Nosferos universe. It's great to see all of you fine people in the chat. Uh, and uh, I'm putting some paint on palette as we speak and having a little bit of difficulty uh, with the cap on the paint. But let's see who we got here in the chat, guys. I hope everybody's having a wonderful Tuesday. Uh, we've got Mighty Geek Studios here. It's great to see you. Let me just say, uh, let me just make sure I say hello to all you fine people. Let me go back. I got to go back to the beginning, as uh, Anigo Montoya once said. Uh, we have got, uh, first and foremost, we have Frankie O in the chat. It is great to see you, Frankie O. We have got Scottsley in the chat. Hail, Scottsley. We've got channel member Timmy Mello in the house. It is great to see you, Timmy Mello. We have got first and foremost the mighty man himself, the first channel member, Stephen Rockwood Drawing. Hail to you, my friend. I hope you're having a wonderful day. We have got John always here, always welcome. One of our regulars. That is the way it is, John. Much love. It is great to see you dropping links like Oscar Meyer as Stephen Rockwood, uh, your father before you, as they say. We've got my comics gay brother, Gabe El Taib. I'm going to bow my head to Gabe El Taib. It's great to see you, brother. Uh, and, uh, yeah, man, I, we were just texting this morning, so it's always great to see you in the chat, man. Uh, yes, indeed. Go check out Gabe's Instagram and all of his great stuff. He's doing all his work, um, that he's working on right now. And then we have got, see, Scottsley, I got, John, I've got, uh, Timmy Mello, Phil, my brother Phil here is in the chat. If I miss you, let me know. If somebody falls down, let's pick him up. It's great to see you, brother Phil, in the chat. Um, we have got Siege Perilous, Perilously Sieging. It's great to see you in the chat, my friend. I hope you're doing well. Uh, let's see here. Mighty Geek Studios is here as well. Thank you for being here, Mighty Geek Studios. I always love seeing that icon. I love seeing your name. It's one of my favorite names we've got in the chat. And where is he? Mr. Monkey Boy 1969. There's nothing going to be complete without Mr. Monkey Boy 1969 here. I mean, you can try. You can claim it's complete, but it's not going to be complete because that's not how it works here. That's not how it works here. So um, here's the thing uh, about art, and here's the thing about detail. Oh, yeah. First, before we get started here, guys, uh, before we get started here, I, I was thinking about putting this in the thumbnail, but I was like, ah, you know, I, I don't want to, you know what I mean. It's like, it's it's a, a personal, you know, uh, Gabe, you know this. I, I Gabe, I lifted a McRib this morning. No, I didn't actually. I've been being very good, man. We're working on getting ourselves in shape, and Gabe is <laughs> leading the way. Um, but I, I did want to start off today by talking about um, the passing of a great artist who influenced me. Um, I did meet him a couple of times when I was, um, or talk to him a couple of times when I was interning at Gaijin Studios. Um, and of course, I'm talking about Jason Pearson. Um, and uh, Jason Pearson was an incredible, I hate even saying it in the past tense, but was an incredible artist. And so much of what I learned from my mentor about storytelling and color theory, I learned from him showing me examples in Jason's work. And uh, my mentor said that Jason was the most talented and gifted uh, uh, person he ever mentored, student and artist he ever mentored. And I can't say that enough, guys. Um, just was a brilliant artist. I was actually referencing subconsciously, or I was, I was picturing in my head, uh, one of his panels when I got the news that I wanted to capture the feel of. What an outstanding artist. So, um, 
you know, draw in peace, uh, Jason Pearson. Um, and uh, thank you for your contributions, man. Thank you so much for those. Really appreciate it. Um, so let me get to work, speaking of, because uh, we've got work to do. And uh, I want to show you guys uh, this panel that I'm working on right now on this mega double page spread. I mean, this is a massive double page spread. And uh, in terms of its detail, in terms of what's what's going on in it. And there was a piece that I did, there was a painting that I did um, very early on in Jonathan Jetty art that was planned for the art books. It ended up in art book two. It wasn't in art book one because art book two uh, became the kind of the, the horror art book as it were. And one of the things that, hold on a second, Stephen. Stephen, just give me a chance. I'll get you there, brother. I'll get you there. But um, but one of the things that that uh, <laughs> one of the things that that I will I will say is is that um, I did this piece called um, uh, let me see what, what what was it called Oh it was called Undead Medley and then I did another one that was called um, Oh gosh what was it called One was Undead Medley the other one was uh, Strigoi Melange. And they were incredibly detailed paintings, very influenced by my love of uh, Alphonse Mucha and his work. And I remember when I started Nosferu, I thought, am I going to have a spread or a page that rivals the complexity of this painting in this book? I mean, that would be the goal, right? And I will tell you, um, this is that this is that image. Like this, this is worth the price of admission, man. This is, uh, it's, it's just, it's an astounding, um, uh, work for me. It's, it's, um, it's, it's a high watermark in what I'm able to do. And, uh, you always want your, your books to finish strong and you want to make sure that the visuals are great without overthinking it. You know what I mean? Cause that's not over. You want if you're going to do something, you want it to be action. You don't want to overthink. And that's the secret to getting anything done. Um, but it's, this is, this is absolutely you know what i planned to do in this book realized in this spread and that's true with every page but this one's special what is up amanda b it is great to see you and i did uh afternoon to you my lady i doff my cap to you um and uh let's see here um i wanted to read this from timmy Mello. make sure i got this so many artists have passed within the last six months just tells you how fast life is and how sudden it ends but a man can live on through his art in this world. You're absolutely right. And I'll say this too, right? The, um, cause I was really, I was feeling it. I, a buddy of mine, um, sent me the news. Um, he had read, uh, because Dan Frega had posted it. And, um, I just texted him like a few times. I texted him back. I'm so sad. <laughs> That's all I could think to say, man. It was, it was rough, you know? And, um, and, and, and I will tell you this though. It's, uh, I am, all I can say is I am so incredibly grateful to how much I learned from Jason's work. Like I said, uh, the few times I interacted with him, and they were brief. Here's how I would describe my interactions with Jason Pearson when I was interning at Gaijin Studios, guys. It's very much um, Proximo's relationship to uh, Marcus Aurelius. You know, if someone said... You knew Jason Pearson? I would say, I did not say I knew him. I said he touched me on the shoulder once. Such was his artistic greatness. Um, but he was very nice to me, and, and I learned a ton. Absolutely right, Michael. Well said, and hail, man. That is absolutely perfect. Yeah. And and I and I think that there are so many people I know uh, who, who, you know, have known him, and, and so many people who haven't known him who have been influenced by his work. And... That's one of the, the things about what we're doing here and, and why we do what we do on YouTube. Um, I, was, I, was just, uh, I was just messaging with, um, with Razorfist today, and I was laughing, when uh, John, when you brought up you were listening to his stuff, because I love, I love listening to Razorfist stuff. And I was telling him um, just how great it is to meet uh, him and to meet somebody who is passionate about these things and has similar sensibilities because at the end of the day it's very much what C.S. Lewis talked about with the Inklings we need our our high level creative brothers uh, and I include my brother Gabe in this um, to um, and the people who are passionate about getting uh, 
pushing back on this nonsense is the best way I could put it. Pushing back on this nonsense so that there is, um, it's not just the, the current isn't just moving in one direction. And that means we have to be great. That means we have to be inspiring. We have to show up. And while people might not think, um, well, I think sometimes creators are so focused on what they're trying to get done, right? Their work, uh, which is as it should be. I think sometimes we, um, we don't realize, uh, or I think with other creators, I'm not thinking about myself in particular, but we don't realize how much somebody speaking sanity in the void can mean to another person. And that's why I always try to make sure I'm telling people that, you know, and supporting the work I believe in financially. And, and I think that's, that's really important because I was thinking about that with regards to, um, well, with regards to, to, you know, many of the artists who have passed and, and, and the fact that, um, just how valuable this audience that has sustained imaginative fiction for decades and built the convention scene has been to the lifeblood of it. When I go to a convention and I support things, that's what I do. This is the lifeblood. And I am so glad. Thank you, John, for, for posting, uh, my brother, Michael, speaking of great people, the choice voice and great patrons of the art, um, and his, uh, now it's called Tesla Academy, but it ha we have to wait to get it um, uh, fixed. But his channel is back. Thank God he was able to save that. Um, and Sark, it is great to see you, Sark. It is wonderful to have you here. Um, and I, But I was thinking about um, what people don't understand about, and what we understand about the space that we're in. When you see people buying collectibles, when you see, po see people buying, um, you know, action figures or buying comic books or books... This this is what keeps the lights on. This is what keeps it going. And I think that that's the thing that um, is so hard for people to understand who are not interacting with the audience and who are not passionate and don't, frankly, don't even understand the audience and have resentment for them. They don't they don't realize that what an amazing what an amazing opportunity it is to find those people out there who look at what you're doing and say, hey man, I get this. I'm inspired by this. Let's do this. Let's make cool fantasy work. And I just don't understand, um, frankly, how anybody could have um, uh, contempt for this this audience, for the people who love comics. And and I've, you know, like I said, um, I will always put my money where my mouth is. I will always um, um, show people, like, I have not, I have not backed any, um, uh, I've left, my, I let subscriptions lapse to certain things, as I'm sure you guys can know, when they fire certain people, because my money has value, or when they insult my intelligence, or they insult the things I value. And I make sure that I back 100% the stuff that is actually working against that. And um, that's, for me, that was what Comicsgate has always been about, and that's what the Iron Age is about. And so um, it's, it's, it's incredible to me it's incredible to get to work on this stuff. So, uh, yeah, thank you guys for being here and thank you for supporting no sphere of the crypt walker. The link is in the description as well as the links to all of the trailer campaigns that I play, including razor fist death mask. Uh, and, uh, if you haven't had a chance to check that out, please do Let me see if I can get this line in there. There we go. But yeah, so this right here, this scene that you're seeing, Hey, good day, Dean. How are you doing, brother? Long time. No see. It's great to see you, my friend. Um, one of the things that um, one of the things that I love about the stuff that we're doing and I enjoy about uh, making this work is I've been looking to a lot of uh, Japanese artists and in particular sculptors. And there was a uh, there's a sculptor whose name escapes me that I learned about from a fellow YouTuber, Horror Monster Collectibles. I've talked about him before. And uh, and please, by the way, tweet the uh, tweet the stream out if you haven't yet. And thank you guys for being here. We got 20 people in here. Make sure you hit that like button. It does help. Um, I know <laughs> I was watching Razor Fist the other day and he goes, I will never ask people to like and subscribe. And I was laughing. I was like, going, uh, don't judge me, Razor. It is what it is. Um, or judge away. It's a free country, thank God. Um, for now, anyway. Um, but, uh, but no, I mean, I was sitting here and I was thinking to myself, like, oh, you know, um, it's, it's, when you see people doing artwork and making stuff that is inspiring to you, like what um, the gentleman who does Horror Monster Collectibles does, 
you want to share it. And when you share it, it influences people. So he told me about a Japanese uh, sculptor who focuses on um, the works of H.P. Lovecraft on his channel, which I hadn't seen. And um, yes, indeed, by the way, yes. Even though I have never forgiven Mike Barron for killing the character of Conchita, I've told him this in Punisher, I believe, issue 17. Sorry for spoilers, but come on, guys, it's been decades. I would encourage you guys to support him. Because this is this is unacceptable, what you're seeing happen with Mike Barron. He's given so much to this industry. He's given so much to this field. He's an amazing writer and creator. Um, if you've got the means and you've got the will and, uh, you know, you're made of iron, do us a favor and support that man. That's how we do it. Indeed. Yes. Oh, yeah. That is, that's intense, man. I was just watching that the other day, man. And yes, indeed. There's the link to the GoFundMe right there for the great Mike Barron. Make it happen. The Red Baron, as I like to call him. R-E-A-D. Let's make it happen. Yeah. Great, great author. Great, great creator. And um, unjustly maligned, to put it mildly. I mean, it's it's so... The, the, the things that people say are just so ridiculous. But we're no stranger to that. That's, that's going to happen anywhere. And I think that's the thing that um, I would encourage all of you guys... Um, all of you guys to, to do for yourselves as a big, it's one of the best bits of advice um, I could probably give anybody in some levels, which is take the time every now and again to take a break and center yourself and say, okay, this is this is what it's about. This is what I'm, I'm doing this for, and this is what I'm after, and these are what my objectives are, these are what my goals are, and this is the direction I'm going to move in. Because I do think sometimes we're bombarded with an ocean of information, and what starts to happen is is that we kind of go to the back part of our brain. We get into fight or flight mode. Or we get into just, um, we're so overwhelmed, we kind of like root or shut down because there's so much negativity out there. And there's and, and while it is great to not walk around asleep, it's also important to be able to think so that you can respond and not react. And I think that one of the things that is so important to the endeavor that you guys are supporting here with Comicsgate um, is that um, we are to make a book is to respond, you know, to to make something, and you have to be very focused and very grounded in order to effectively respond. And so it really commands a lot because we have the same um, we have the same noise coming in. We have the same BS. And in Mike Barron's case, you have um, you know targeted harassment and slander and all of those things, and maintaining your your focus really does um is something that you got to make sure you're doing but it also is i can't overstate the importance of the support that we receive from people i'm sure that people like gina carano really appreciate it i'm sure that any creator eric july um but it, it is something that i i can't overstate that we're trying to perpetually make the decisions and the highly sophisticated decisions that are involved in the making of artwork under, you know, that barrage. Some of us way more than others. Um, and, uh, and I don't count myself as someone who is way more than others by any stretch. But it is one of those things. And, oh, do we have, whoa, 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 whoa. Do we have channel member General Piggy in the house? I doff my cap to you, sir. And I reveal my absolutely haphazard hair. Um, it is, it is absolutely nuts. Um, uh, Mike got banned on Kickstarter for being racist, even though the main character is a Cuban American veteran. Yeah, don't let logic get in the way of their, um, uh, you know, their arguments. Lord knows they don't. Uh, <laughs> it's just how it is, man. I mean, look, guys, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. One of the ways that you know you're in Comicsgate, and one of the great things about it, you know what Comicsgate's about, is that when we see a situation that is absolutely crazy. And we see a feedback loop that is absolutely crazy. We don't continue to do the same things. We just don't. We adjust because we can adjust because we're not locked into a particular way of thinking. And that is a very useful thing for creators. And I think what Comicsgate has done that is, is so useful is it, it forces artists to change a, a habit that has really taken root probably uh, since the industry was, you know, basically um what's the word i'm looking for 
I want to say carved in stone, but basically when it became solid on its foundation, which is leaving the selling of your work to other people and leaving all of these um, things that take your power away in the hands of bureaucrats. And it is a hell of a thing for this generation of artists. I think Image has done it, and uh, a lot of independent comic publishers have put people in that position. But Comicsgate is unique in the sense that it um, it really forces you to to kind of start from scratch, and hence the Iron Age, right? That's what we do. Um, Bob and Weave, I think I've heard that somewhere. Yes, you have. Absolutely. Uh, Timmy Mello channel member says, and it's amazing. Private American is basically the only way to spread awareness of the border crisis. And yet Mike is accused of being an, yes, an istrafo because American modernity guys. Yeah, well, here's the thing, right? Um, it is the dehumanization of black pilling and people don't fall for it. Amen and hail razor fist for that. Yes, indeed. Hello, Phil with two L's as a man to be. Um, yes, indeed. And General Piggy. Um, they don't count Cubans because they tend to be conservative. Well, of course, that's, it's a very, um, yes, yeah, totally fictitious accusations. Yeah, no kidding, yeah. Um, and this is the thing about it, guys, is that, um, that's, slander and defamation is how this stuff works. I had a really interesting, um, message from, um, uh, oh my gosh, uh, Blue Line, yes, exactly. Yeah, you guys know. I had a very interesting message from a former student, and I'm not gonna, you know, mention the student's name. But it was really interesting because um, it reminded me of one of the, the things I was so grateful um, to, to leave when I left academia, okay? And, and this is something that I, and I think it's a bigger issue. Again, this is with, uh, the person is very nice. Uh, or my experience with them has been positive. I have nothing negative to say about this person. But they, um, although I disagree with, with their tactic um, in resolving a particular situation, but they were talking to me about a classmate of theirs that they knew that, uh, that, uh, that, that they felt was, was you know, a plagiarist and was plagiarizing their work. And, and from, from what I've seen and, and from the stuff I've seen, um, that would appear to be the case, either through ignorance or whatever. And I don't tend to... The plagiarism thing isn't, isn't a hill I'm going to die on, to be perfectly honest. It's... it's I'm not I'm not a fan of it and when it's blatant I think it's just you know embarrassing for the person doing it but I mean it doesn't keep me up at night because if it did I probably would never sleep certainly having watched uh, institutions and um, various awards things look the other way um, I remember when I was in high school and some uh, local art awards for high school students looked the other way when I pointed out plagiarism as a college professor I've saw I've seen um, uh, Society of Illustrators and the college looked the other way when a student plagiarized and won a scholarship. I've seen all sorts of stuff like that, so it's not my, my bag. But this person was talking in such a way that um, they said to me, and they wanted to know if I, a person who no longer works at the school, with a student who no longer goes to the school, would talk to them about their plagiarism, and that they wanted to remain anonymous, and they were discussing this with 10 other people and whatever else. And it it really struck me because I've been out of that environment. And hail Agent Zero, it's great to see you, my friend. I've been out of that environment for so long, I had forgotten what it was like. I had forgotten what it was like for people to um, want to work behind the scenes and not confront people forthrightly and instead spend way more energy uh, talking amongst themselves and trying to appeal to um, you know, an authority force um, with their accusations for punishment without being taking responsibility for the accusation. And, and I think, and it struck me as, this is not how you can effectively solve problems. Period. It is not the way to do it. And it really kind of, it was amazing to me because um, it's almost like, um, how much energy, how do I word this? How much energy does it take uh, to make artwork versus to sit around obsessed with this person who's plagiarizing and doing something you don't want to do. I just don't understand it. And even when a, you've got people like we're dealing with who don't like what somebody's going is doing because they just don't like them and they don't want them to be successful. Uh, hail Julie Pascal and hail awesome one. Where is Julie? Just saw you, Julie. There you are. Great to see you, Julie. Um, and hail awesome one. Um, but even if you, you don't like this person, right, and even if you, you don't care for them, um, the thing about it is, is why spend your energy obsessed with them? And while 
I know a lot of, of our, you know, detractors and, and people who don't like what independent creators are doing in this space um, talk about how we're obsessed with them. The opposite is actually true. And so I guess the bigger thing I, I wanted to say to people, which is so, so important, and, I, and is probably in agreement with Eric July, is there is no, you know, there, there is no set pie, which I absolutely believe in. And somebody else's success is not what's causing your lack of success. Now, somebody else's gossip, machinations, defamations, and as is often said and a part of our law is built on it, um, bearing false witness is absolutely responsible for, um, for, you know, can hurt your business. But it's the thing about it is, is that someone else who is lying and achieving is not why you're not achieving. Because people who lie about work or misrepresent themselves seldom get success. They're seldom successful. People who gossip about others and don't make anything are seldom successful. And not successful um, in the long run, certainly, if they're plagiarizing. We've seen this over and over again. So don't concern yourself with it. Avoid it. Avoid it. Marcus Kelgroots, great to see you, my friend. I hope you are doing well. Hail to you. Um, no, 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 no. There is pie. There is pie, John. It's going to be... Listen, I would n never... Long may it be so. There is pie. Pie for everyone, I say. Um, here's the link to the upcoming uh, Chrome Dog mailing list. There it is. The campaign starts February 3rd. Guys, go check it out. It's what we do here, man. Um, absolutely. Amen. And that's the thing that I think about... Um, I think about all the time, right? It's the... Um, it's, it's the way that we go about this stuff. Oh my gosh, you guys are killing me. Um, it's, uh, I can't, don't, don't, don't put pie on there. That, I can't do it. I can't do it, pie. Uh, thank goodness without pie <laughs> sounds miserable. You're absolutely right. Um, the viper's nest of people narking rather than working hard um, and being original. And here's the thing, guys. It, I was thinking about this today. I am going to do amazing work and people are going to buy it. And if people are, are, you know, I have absolute confidence that people are going to, the more people who see it and the more people realize, oh, crap, he's serious. He really is making great stuff and getting this stuff done, you know, because it that's just, you know, not everybody has um, uh, bought my two art books in the first two campaigns. A lot of people, huge part of my audience is um, finding out about me now that I'm, I'm doing this book, which is excellent. I love that. Um, but this is the thing about it, is that once they see it, they will have missed that early part, but there is no scenario. I will not concede a scenario where people don't see this and are like, wow, this is really good. I need to have this, period. I need this in my life. And that is the way I do it. Proceed as if success is inevitable, but do the work to get yourself there. And it's the grind. It really is the grind. But the work of gossip, the fruits of gossip has only worked in a um, um, in a, a investor economy where you've got, you know, these massive companies saying, I don't know, maybe we should fund this news site that just gossips. It, it's falling apart. That stuff is not going to last. And you see people, when they watch the success of that, they think, well, that's a way to success. But it's not. It's a temporary way of doing things. Oh my gosh, Julie Pascal, I'm so sorry to hear that. I'm homesick and fell into a communist Twitter. I'm glad I saw Shuffles Live and been safe. Yeah, stay away from communism. It's it's absolutely poison. And hey, amen and hail to waffles. Never forget, guys. Or pies. I can't tell. Those pies are waffles. They look great either way. I'm down. I'll eat. I prefer cheesecake. Well said. Listen, we accept all types here. You guys know this. Whatever your dessert needs are, we're here to help. That's what we're here to do. But it's it is a fascinating thing because um, I think that um, I think that that's resentment is such a a mind poison and the the more time you spend on things that you do not like the more they are your master and do not let that stuff be your master talk about the stuff that you love be passionate work your butt off and expect to be you know uh, treated with respect when you conduct yourself with respect and if people don't they don't need to be in your life but I think it's 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 so important that that we basically said to ourselves look we can't control because 
um, they don't care. We can't control what these mega corporations think of us and, and what they're going to do. And we can't control any creators. But a group of creators, which is to say Comicsgate, which is to say Eric July and the Ripperverse, which is to say Razor Fist, which is to say uh, so many people in our space said, well, why don't we treat the customers the way that we think customers should be treated? Why don't we give them the entertainment that they want? And here we are. You know, and this is what made it possible. There you go. Now it's people are, are splitting hairs uh, politically. It's scary here with the, the, the cheesecake conversation. Yes, absolutely. Get better soon. Um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, man. That's that's what we're about here. But it's it's this is the thing, right? Yeah, mind poison is good phrasing as it taints everything else in your life. It does. And and this is the thing, right? So let's talk about let's talk about, you know, Nosferu and what I'm what I'm working on here and get back to a little bit of Japan. So I've been looking for some really great um I've been waiting for really great comic adaptations of um of Lovecraft because I personally um I love his stuff and I would create it if I felt like I could that was my kind of thing. I could do it in terms of um an adaptation. But there are Japanese manga artists who are doing a great job. And this um, there are also Japanese sculptors who are doing incredible limited run beautiful art pieces of Lovecraft creatures. And when I saw Horror Monster Collectibles sharing one of his new acquisitions and really doing a great thorough review of it, it really got me thinking about and, and inspired about what I'm doing with the Lovecraftian stuff. So you've got a sculptor in Japan, you've got a YouTuber... Uh, somewhere in the States, I think maybe he's out West, and coming together to kind of inspire each other to, by sharing their interests. And I think that that, for me, is one of the great things about what we're doing here. I'm inspired when I see success in other people, and I'm uh, inspired when I see integrity. And if you keep yourself surrounded by that stuff, it will lift you up and it will put you in a better mood like nothing else will. And no amount of criticism of the things that are bad, although it must exist and it must be free to be done, um, is going to fill that particular aspect of your life. And seeing people who are inspired and being positive is really important and I think it's needed in greater measure. And so sometimes I think you know, that that's the most important thing we can offer with our work is to say, look, it's not everywhere. If as long as one of us is left to do, and there's more than one of us, to keep making artwork the way that we think it should be done, we can never say that there is no artwork being done that respects the fans, that has artistic integrity, uh, and that is is disciplined and, and where I feel like I have a connection with the creator. As long as we're drawing breath and we're drawing artwork, that ain't gonna be the problem. Um, okay, uh, let me see here. Shamf, artist question. Um, is there any chance the artist haphazarded their way into Boston uh, embrace MLK sculpture being... I have no idea. Uh, the artist haphazarded their way into Boston. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure. Um, but uh, heavens, that sounds like there's a lot there. Timmy Miller, yeah, it was pretty... Oh, wait, hold on a second. Um, Timmy Miller, yeah, it was just vulgar and unnecessary. MLK was not perfect, but the messages were very important and inspiring. Agreed with that. Many questions about the sculpture and all of them are... Oh, my goodness. Okay, I'm, I'm going back. I'm going back here. Okay, dear heavens. It sounds like I missed something incredibly major that has occurred. Um, it's ridiculous. They were being purposely pretentious and how their art looks stupid. Yes. Oh, I get what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, guys... I mean, you have to understand that there is um, there is a beyond unhealthy and obsessed preoccupation that is um, projected uh, onto men that is really not about us. That's all I will say, and uh, and it is to see the obsession with it on a particular <laughs> side of the aisle. And the lack of awareness with how obsessed they are is is absolutely hilarious. Because it's like going, uh, I'm not the one who brought this up. Why are you talking about it? And I think that, you know, for me anyway, when I see people, you know, doing that kind of thing, and that disrespect has been going on um, socially for a very long time, um, that you just have to kind of take it with a grain of salt. The big thing is, is that 
The purpose of that kind of stuff is, again, not to convince anybody, not to reframe anything. It's to demoralize people. And I just, I, I, I'm just at the point to where it's like the, um, there's a pretentiousness that started in the fine art space that has been, um, that has been responsible for a lot of, of the ills that we're seeing. Like I was talking with a friend of mine um, on the phone not long ago, actually, just a couple hours ago. And I was saying to him, I go, you know, the thing that gets me about the space that we're in right now is that we're we're seeing um, we're seeing people who are um, are are afraid of things and art. I would give have art be one of those things, but we're seeing people who are afraid of things because of um, who are afraid of things because of the stigma that's put around them. So I'll give you an example. People right now have a very uneasy relationship with art, museums, the arts, and um, that extends to, um, you know, feeling comfortable with what art they like and all that kind of stuff. Maybe not so much in pop culture, but the second something comes near the definition of art, you see this happen. And it's because at a certain point, um, people didn't feel like it was accessible to them. And it's a very odd thing because... Um, for me, I think, and but it is a real thing, and I, I've been thinking about it a lot. I talked to a friend of mine. I said, we need to combat it because there's something about what you guys are doing when you back these books that is very similar to buying art. Why are you buying this book? Well, you are buying art, obviously, but why are you buying this book? Well, because I like it. Oh, cool, but, like, you know, what, how, what do you think about that? Why aren't you buying this book? And... Why are you buying original art? A lot of you guys buy original art in this space. And there are so many people who are uncomfortable with buying things that are, are you know, um, that are handmade or that aren't made by corporations. And I think a lot of that has to do with the, the, the kind of comfort that people have in buying something that has, again, as Eric July would say, perceived legitimacy. But perceived legitimacy in and of itself is... is um, is different than what uh, something that has a track record is, which is sort of what we're doing here. And so um, when people see my work and and see, you know, the success it's having and, and, and you know, that people are buying it and they're excited about it and, you know, they see the trading cards, they know my history and illustration and comics and blah, blah, they, um, they see it and they feel like, oh, but that's different. That's a reputational thing, which is why they go after reputation and defend perceived legitimacy. And so when you see someone like Mike Barron being attacked, they're attacking his reputation and they're attacking him on the grounds of perceived legitimacy, if that makes sense. Yeah, the only way it ends is if people are pushed to the point of being fed up and that kind of tradition is crammed down their throat. Yeah, it feels like Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes, I know, absolutely. Yeah, uncanceled beauty is right. Hail, Eric Cabrera. It is great to see you in the house, man. Yeah, they don't understand art. that art is subjective and they don't understand that, um, again, that it's... If you're around skilled people and passionate people, and you're around even better, a a sophisticated audience that likes passionate creators and likes stuff that is made with care, as opposed to stuff that is made that is you know schlock pushing a, a political agenda, what you're going to find is you're going to find um, an audience that moves things in a particular way, and where there's plenty of room for success, and there's plenty of room for excellence. To me. That is the reason why um, ComicsGate and people who are creators in ComicsGate are so supportive of creators like Mike Barron and Ethan Van Skyver and myself. Because at the end of the day, the reason is, is that they appreciate quality and they can see quality. They don't, they, they're not just about um, perceived legitimacy. And I think that that's, I can't overstate how, um, I've never been about perceived legitimacy. I've always liked stuff because I've liked it. It's always been the case. Um, I didn't care um, one bit about, you know, uh, I didn't hate something because it was successful and I didn't hate something because everyone didn't like it, if that makes sense. That's just not how I work. Yeah. We enjoy original art because it gives us access to the overall process of how the end product is made. Exactly. And that's the cool thing about it, right? So I think that, you know, that's, that's the thing, which is when you start really asking yourself, about what it is you like and what it is you're interested in. It really frees you up 
to do things like buy original artwork and buy, you know, crowdfunded comics and things like that because you're no longer a, a slave to perceive legitimacy. And what's really funny is, is that um, if you, uh, how do I word this? It's almost like uh, if you see, if you're in Comics Gate and if you're in this space uh, versus if you hate this space, those are two very different things, let's be clear. Um, on the one end, you would rather take a 35% effort from an established brand than a 95% effort from somebody who is um, uh, not an established brand. And we're the opposite. Like, we would rather have success. We don't care how big it is, you know? Societies like water seeking the lowest point. Yes, indeed. God calls us to rise like smoke. God's logic versus man's logic. Amen. Yeah, absolutely right. So here we go. Let me see what I can do here. So when I'm working on this story, and I'm trying to figure out, you know, like how this thing is going to go, one of the great things about this process of creating handmade work and creating um, a story that I'm responsible for, solely responsible for, um, is that every now and again through this creative process, I will have something happen where it informs the story. And... I have had this scene. I knew what the scene was. I knew what she was going to be. But I didn't know... Um, I, I knew there was going to be a female character. I knew what this female character in the backstory was going to be responsible for. But what I didn't know, and what really kind of surprised me, was that there was this opportunity to introduce a character that I had always envisioned introducing into this world later on. Uh, and, you know, Stephen, this one, you know, this character's for you. And because I didn't hadn't thought about that, um, it it you know it wasn't until I saw this page, and that's a big part of the creative process, right? Um, I hadn't seen this this um, gotten to this page yet, and it just gave me an opportunity to add more depth and add another character to the story. And so this character right here that you're seeing is um, is a character that I had planned on bringing into the world of Nosferu at some point in a very different way. And because um, the the first issue of this book that introduces this world is a very narratively um, dense book, which is to say it's not a chore to read. Like, it's not designed to be a chore, right? It's high plot. Um, and uh, But it's, it's designed to be something that when you read it, it's like the jumping off point for things. So it's like when you're watching Star Wars, per se. Um, the very first movie in 1977, uh, and they say something like, well, they've dissolved the Senate. You don't go to the Senate, you don't get the details of the Senate, but you know the Senate is there, and it sets up a lot of what's to come. It's very much the same way with this, man. Damn right, Stephen Rockwood. I've always got your back, man. I've always got your back. And um, and, and that's the thing about it, right, is that you get the sense when you're 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 building this stuff that everything, you know, the first project that you do when you're, you're doing a story, the first um, book or issue or whatever, you're introducing a lot of things to, to just kind of break the static friction of storytelling. When you're doing a continuation of a story, you, can, you don't have to generate your own heat as much. You know, you can play a little bit of a soundtrack or you can uh, show something that's familiar and people talk about the idea of member berries, but I, I think it just comes down to you know, or callbacks, but you know the most basic way of looking at it is it's it's taking somebody's familiarity with something or their well regard for it and trading on it. Well, when you're doing something like this, you're writing that language. And while I'm obviously pulling from American pop culture and and all of these wonderful things uh, that that pop culture, horror, and adventure comics and pulp are built on. Um, I'm really setting things up in such a way that this first issue, I want people to go back to it like we go back to early issues of uh, Spider-Man and go, holy cow, he introduced Dr. Octopus and all these characters in the first, you know, Ditko and Lee in the first 10 issues. Like, holy cow. Um, how does it feel uh, How does it feel uh, to know a lot of what if or alternate versions of mainstream characters could have been their own original if perceived legitimacy didn't exist? I, oh my gosh. Um, how does it feel? Oh boy. Mm, that's a really interesting question. Dang, you got me, man. I have to think on that. Because I would say this. I would say this. Um, that it's, indeed, 
it's like this. Um, I think that the hardest thing in the world to do, well, let's, let's talk about it this way. Let me rephrase it just a little bit, or let me frame it from my perspective. I don't think that the creators of the past who created characters that were brilliant in their own right, but inside of a world where they did known equity in them, I don't think that they were, um, I don't think I'm any smarter than them. I think that, that we can only see as far as our brain allows us to see outside of a particular system, right? And I so I think that they were brilliant. And I think the big question is, what was it that those creators felt they did not have? What what did they feel like they didn't have in their current creative situation um, that would allow them to do it? And I would say that what they didn't have is the audience they built. They didn't really build their audiences. What they did was they took an existing audience because it is very tough to build an audience. They didn't feel like they had the opportunity to do so. So my assumption has always been, and they were probably right, which was if I want to eat, they weighed the risks and they said, if I want to eat, the risks are way too high for me to do that. So I just don't think they had that luxury that we have, you know, to do this. And I think that this luxury that we're in right now is absolutely something that um, one should, if you have, think you have the skill and you're willing to take the risk, it is risk. There are no guarantees um, at all. And I think it was, uh, some creator was talking um, uh, recently, and I'm not going to say who I think it was because I don't remember, but they were saying, basically, you don't really make a profit um, on your stuff in terms of your, your creator own stuff, unless you hit a, a level that is higher than most people would think because of printing and life expenses and marketing and all of those things. And certainly, you know, probably around like, you know, uh, $90,000. Okay. That's, that's real. That's real stuff there. And people need to know that. And so why would a people with parent or with uh, kids, people maybe with parents to support, but people with kids, with spouses, with, with all those, those things, um, who are expect who are creative and can't imagine not being creative in their jobs? Why would they stay in a place where they will not have, um, well, they will not have any equity in the stuff they create? Um, a belief and a a understanding that if they were to leave, that they would not be able to live. I think that's the simplest thing, and so I have a tremendous amount of respect for them, uh, a tremendous amount of respect. And I think it's it's also there's perce perceived legitimacy, and then I think there's also um, understood risk. And being in this space is fraught with risk, as is leaving a career, as I did. Um, it is fraught with risk, and uh, anybody who tells you that you know there isn't risk in doing this is lying to you. And anyone who tells you that there aren't um, there aren't time periods where you you are like, oh my gosh, this is this is a lot, is is kidding you, and that is why it's so important when we're doing this stuff to keep ourselves focused on the creating the stuff. But yeah, I I have nothing but respect for the comic book artists and creators who came before us and built this, and I think it's so um, it's so unfortunate that a very callous generation of creators, or I should say, um, thoughtless generation of creators sought to lay waste to it so that it, it wouldn't be able to be revitalized on their, uh, during their time as creators, but it was in fact eroded. It's very unfortunate, but that leaves us in this position to where we have to, um, you know, achieve escape velocity and, uh, and in, you know, and, and escape velocity is harder to achieve than orbit and maintaining orbit. So yeah, I think that's what they were probably doing. They're probably just trying to maintain orbit. What is up, Shipper Militia? It's great to see you. Better late than never, Hail Shoff. Hail to you, my friend. Channel member. It is great to see you, Mr. Militia. Always great to see you here. Everybody's saying hello, hello. But yeah, I mean, that to me is the biggest thing. Yeah, risks. Yeah, bow to Mrs. and Jetty. Amen. And she's been having a time of it today. So, um, and she's a, a huge support, but um, she's been having her own uh, frustrations with with stuff. So yeah, every bit helps, guys. I can't overstate it. Um, they they support us and they're great for us and um, and we lean on them and they lean on us and it's uh, it's a wonderful thing to have that support system. And I never um, I, I yeah I never take it lightly. She's great. Can't overstate that. Amazing person, hard worker, 
and um, and dealing with what I think we all deal with from time to time, you know. And I think that um, you know when I sit here and I I create this stuff and I'm doing this work, it's and I tell people it's like the greatest thing about supporting independent artists is you see the impact on them in real time it is not some massive thing you know it's not some huge corporation where you you know <laughs> gosh i can't think of things that aren't foul metaphors so i gotta work on myself um but yeah they they you get to see whose life you're affecting and who you're impacting it's big uh Shanth, what is the medium watercolor only um or mixed with some acrylics so this is heavy body acrylics used in washes over um on a canvas textured um, canvas textured uh, crescent board, I believe. Yes, crescent board. So yeah, great stuff. I highly recommend it. Um, love out to the great Miss Jetty. This too, in time, will pass. Amen. And thank you so much. And there's uh, Sierra Whiskey's uh, no cover book right there. Go check it out, guys. I do love that. It is great. <laughs> it cracked me up when I found out what it was about. For the longest time, I was hearing about it, but I, I wasn't. I was like, what is this about? And they were, oh, got it. It's another one of our brilliant, brilliant um, comics gate bits of lore isn't it that's what makes it fun but i mean that's that to me is that's that to me is the fun of all of this stuff so i've had this this character for um a long time that uh since the since probably before art book one or during art book one all the way to art book two uh where the character finally uh, manifest and uh it is a very very um sexy beautiful um mummy character female mummy and i've been wanting to uh create this use this character in the story and i finally decided that this book is going to be the first appearances to end all first appearances book man and indeed cg lore is the best and comics gate does work absolutamente no doubt about it but it, it is an interesting thing because um you know we have the we have this incredible opportunity uh, to make stuff and to show people stuff uh, and be, you know, create the first appearances of characters. And that's why I always say, don't don't try to compete with your competition, or I should say the industry, on their terms. In terms of brand recognition and reach, you have to understand you're building everything you're doing from scratch. So that's that's rule number one. But also realize that you can move. That you can make changes quicker. You can. Um, you have no uh, editorial oversight trying to water down what you're doing. And if you, um, if you don't remind yourself of that, sorry, just need a little support here for this this board here. But if you don't remind yourself of that every single day, you're leaving money on the table and you're leaving creativity unutilized. And so, yeah, that's that's been a big thing for me in looking at this stuff. Has been you know going. Oh, all right. So here's what I need to do. Here's what I need to make happen. And here we go. Here's some details right here. What is up, Skunk Artworks? It is great to see you, my friend, artist brother. Great to see you. Uh, John, yeah, he's a, a new one. It's the uh, way uh, Crom the Destroyer, I think it's called. Ooh, very cool. Um, yeah, my reading comp is as glorious as uh, I often tell you. But yeah, creativity is where it's at, guys. And I mean creativity in the sense of productivity. We've got our imaginations and then we've got the ability to do it and put what we do, what we see in our head, we can put that on paper. And and again, you know, it's when you see trailers at the start of this, when I play trailers from other creators in this space, and I say that out of respect that, you know, Razor Fist is is not Comics Gate. He's Razor Fist and he's um He's in this space, just like you know Eric July. You know Ripa gives um, is always very good to us, and but he's he's Ripaverse. He has where he has the right to be an individual. Dare I say, right? The one thing the mi mainstream can't tolerate. Um, but the thing I would say about it is is that um, that's the thing that you really get when you look at these these independent creators, and that's why I love putting those trailers at the start of this show, because I want to remind people and show people that this is bigger than just. Um, this is a group of individuals, yes, but it is bigger than one person, and that we have an incredible track record um, for making brilliant stuff, just like with any independent. And it was the same thing in the 80s with the independents. Those creators got together, and they started to say, hey, listen, if you like my work, let's do crossovers, and if you like my work, buy this person's work, or check this person's stuff out, um, when they saw artwork that they liked and respected. 
and that's sort of what we do here. People are like, oh my gosh, you like horror, you like this, you like painting, gotta check out Sean's stuff. Oh man, Back Nose Pharaoh, this dude's stuff is cool. Like, guys, thank you. Thank you so much. Because that is, that's how we build it, man. And I keep working, and we put this thing together. This right now, this is the hardest part for any creator, is the part that I'm in right now the beginning stage this is just you're breaking static friction you're telling people about your book you know you're the audience who has bought your previous stuff is smaller than the new audience you're trying to attract so this is a very tough time and the people who are with you now it's like that's what do you say I mean what can you say for them it's an amazing thing yeah it's weird but yeah we you know what are you gonna do we're just a normal sane group of people right yeah i mean that dude's awesome hail kssss good to see you my friend and happy birthday of course um but yeah man it is it is guys it's it's so big what we're doing here and i want people to to you know however you do it like i was i was working um gosh i think when i did my first art book i was working um full time and i was commuting um 90 miles up and 90 miles back it was a lot but I can, I can handle a lot. I can absolutely handle a lot. Um, and we were talking about it the other day with somebody, and they were talking about, good Lord, how much did that cost, especially how much would it cost now? And I said, you know, the thing is, is that there is a why. Like, when you love something like I loved teaching and working, you know, with, with students and college students, um, can sustain anyhow. You'll find a way to do it. But the second the why disappears... And people are asking you to do something that you don't believe in and that you don't want any part of. It just can't go on. And the thing about this is, when you're running your own thing and you're making your own comic books, the thing that is so great about this is, is that you are confronted with, you better have a damn good why every morning, and that's what you're confronted with. And I absolutely, um, oh no, I still, yeah, listen, hey guys, I love, let me just say this, I enjoyed teaching because I love helping people. Um, and uh, especially people who take the initiative and learn how to empower themselves and help themselves with that stuff. So yeah, I will always love um, helping people. What I'm here to do, and and with everything is, um, and this is the the thing about it is that I'm here to demand people acknowledge. I shouldn't say demand, but yeah, actually, kind of. <laughs> I'm here to demand people acknowledge my excellence at doing something. Because it's not enough for me for people to profit off of the things that I did, which is exactly what happened. And then say, no, but we're not going to, um, we don't support you or your family or the things you want to get done. And we don't value your opinion even when it's shown to be correct. And I'm not saying that in bitterness. I'm saying that in acknowledgement. Do you guys get what I mean? It's it's something that people miss about what we're doing here. Do you know what I mean? Um, Sean, don't mean to sidetrack you, but question, in your opinion, is the Sean Connery film... The Rock, a James Bond film. Yes. Easy enough. You bet it is. <laughs> I, I just love that. I love that theory, man. Love that theory. You gotta be kidding me. It's great stuff. You know, it's it's nuts. But I mean, you know, you have to... I will tell you this, that... Um, I remember when I was listening to... Um, or I was watching The Power of Myth with Joseph Campbell. And it's got some interesting stuff in it. You know? And it's, it's like... Um, but one of the things that really sort of struck me is is how when you've got something that you're passionate about those those very normal and natural um, priorities of survival and security go absolutely to the wayside when you've got something that you're living for that's really important and friendship is one of those things and faith can be one of those things and, and, and Excellence can be one of those things in drive, but we need those things. We need passion. And hail James Hayes. Good to see you, my friend. Hello, Jonathan. All of you fine folks in the chat, I hope that you're having a great day. And we hope you're having a great day, James Hayes, as always. Always bringing the positive energy. Yeah, indeed. Agreed. Yeah, I love I love The Rock. That movie is great, man. Um, but it's, it's one of those things to where um, all people really want at the end of the day is to be able to take their skills be useful and have their their um 
yeah, that's it. <laughs> I think I think that might be it, and be able to to earn the success that they're capable of earning. That's it. And what was the example I was thinking of with this? Because it really affected me. I was thinking about this just the other day. Someone uh, who I was, I heard talking about this, um, and it's it's like um, you kind of saw this a little bit um, with the movie. Although I'm not wild about everything in it, but you again, duh. Uh, I, I got to stop having that be a caveat. But I remember in The Incredibles when you've got that kid who's the fastest runner and isn't ever allowed to win the race because he's got to hide what he's able to do. That is, in a nutshell, what happens in intellectual circles. And intellectual circles that have, have been sort of taken over by the, the Marxist kind of stuff. And it's a terrible thing to do to a human being. It's a terrible thing to... Um, to make someone else's success about your success and about your failure. And um, and I never do that. I see people being successful and it makes me happy. It's a normal way of doing things. Um, I told uh, Noah that he doesn't need art school. He has access to Shelby for free who teaches him all he needs. Yeah, that's right. I actually said the same thing to Noah when I was on a stream with him. You know, I've, I've got a lot of experience um, being in that space. And here's the thing. Here's what you need. And here's the first thing that they sort of take away from you. God, the seat cushion is not feeling great. Got the crack in my back here. Um, but this is one of the things that that I think people miss out on. Um, well, I, I have painted digitally, <laughs> so um, no one's ever really told me, but I do make it. I do make it my business to learn how to do it. Yeah, but I mean, it's so funny, guys. And 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 I have to say this: you guys know, you guys already know the answer to that. What is this sick obsession, and I say this with love, that people have with watching people paint traditionally? I was watching Bob Ross yesterday, guys. Yesterday, I was watching Bob Ross, and I'm like going, I'm watching a dude from my childhood, God rest him no longer with us, painting oils, and it feels fantastic, and I could go into this room and paint. Like, I could actually just pick myself up and paint in the next room, but I see Bob Ross painting, and I'm like, this is the best chills down my spine people i would i if i painted digitally and someone else asked me this i think it was my my friend jeremy uh whose book uh beckoned is out guys link in the description i always play the trailer please check it out and he said to me i don't get why do uh i don't get as many views and people don't check out my channel as much when i do digital artwork as they do when i do traditional artwork i don't know what that is but i think john you just took the words out of my mouth I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read yours. There is something therapeutic about it, like being around water. My God, that is great and profound. And that's, I don't think I've ever heard it summed up better. That's, that's really good, John. That's really good, man. Yes, I think that's what it is. I think it's because it, it centers us. I think it, it is like this one pointed meditation. And I think we associate the computer with stress and work a lot of times you know i really do i think that this is you guys know when you watch me paint you're like sean's got this i'm sitting back i'm watching it i'm enjoying it i'm backing it go do your thing go do the trade that you do which is painting and illustrating and i get to sit back enjoy it have a conversation with you 100 percent, man 100 percent. i think you're right on that yeah um, I watched Bob Ross because I've never seen a finished painting. I passed out or <laughs> so relaxed. I'm so, yes, I'm not, you may be kidding. That absolutely knocks me out, man. It's the best stuff. And you're very welcome, John. You're very welcome. It is the material universe being manifested. You're right. You guys are watching. Um, you guys are are watching the, the physicality of this being adjusted. And you guys know this. You can come back and watch it and you can have it be digital. You can rewind it. You can skip back. You can watch it again. Um, you can do any number of things with this video. But when you're watching it live and you're watching me make it, I cannot go back and reverse through time the making of this painting. I can't. This is a physical thing in the physical world happening in real time. And when you get that book, it is going to be printed. It is going to be the first printing. And that is the only chance you're going to have to get that first printing. And that's what it is. You know, it's it's absolutely insane when I think about how crazy that is. Um, it's the fact that they can see the human element of the painting. Well said. Mighty Geek, I, I really think you guys are dialed in on it, man. 
It's because digital art seems like playing it safe and traditional art is viewed as some in some tangible way that needs to be done right or not at all. You know what's so funny is, um, oh, let me read this one too. Uh, two, it is our idealist, um, idealized world. All the good stuff with the negative being able to be left out. That's true. Um, sneaky ASMR, the sound of a brush. Oh my God, you're right on cam pencil and paper. Um, or uh, nib quill scratching. Shout out to Jason Bascom. Hail Jason. Um, combined with the work in progress, it's beautiful. Amen. Um, I can compare the love for painting to a kid being given a coloring book with crayons. When you're coloring the page, it's like you're making something wrong into right. Wow. Man, you guys are philosophical on this fine Tuesday. My brother, I take off my hat and I bow to my main man, Jeremy Ice and Fire, everybody. Welcome, Jeremy, to the stream. My brother, my New England brother, it's great to see you. And my God, my fellow Into the Pie Barons stream uh, participant and watcher, Jim Cox is here. I'm here for car crashes, derailments, dumpster fires, and train wrecks. These are a few of my favorite things. Uh, <laughs> Hail Jim Cox, it is great to see you, brother. Hail Sheeple Hunter, it is great to see you too, my friend. Um, and the rest of yes, amen. Congrats on second place. Thank you, Jeremy. Winshant easily could have been number one. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, man. Um, right? It's about the work. We do this stuff. We love this stuff. That's what makes it happen, man. And, and you know... It's so funny. I think there are different um, classes in Comics Gate, which is to say, like graduating classes, like people who come up together. And um, I don't know what the exact time when we started really kind of catching fire, but I always feel like Jeremy and I are of the same class in terms of what we're doing. Like we were there together building this stuff. Yeah, he is. Jim Cox is the man. That's all there is to it. Never forget. Um, but yeah, it is great to see you guys in here, man. It's because we're doing stuff that. Um, we're doing stuff that where we're working and we're building this stuff up and it's just all positivity, man. It's just, it's, um, it's, it's just about, it's about the love and it's about the, the putting work together. And I know that, 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 you know, the thing about for me anyway, when I'm doing this, the, the physical stuff of this, it's, there's a vulnerability in doing this stuff, um, and doing this stuff physically, which is you guys see the, the imperfections, you see how it comes together but it definitely, I think there's this element of it that feels like it is, um, uh, it's not like you're watching a simulation of something secondhand. You're watching um, something physical and the physical world being done and you're seeing it live. And you're kind of experiencing it to as close to firsthand as you can. The only person who has a better seat in the house um, making this work is me. The camera is between me and the paper right now. So you guys are actually the row in front of me watching this happen when you tune into these streams, man. It's it's just crazy, man. Oh, listen, if people start, uh, yeah, people start critiquing grammar on this place, man, I mean, I'm doomed. Uh, it, if gra bad grammar was a crime, I would be on death row, man. That let there be no uh, let there be no doubt of that. But I do think that. Um, that, that it is the best seat of the house. Like my wife always says to me, she's like, babe, I know you love boxing. Would you ever like to go see you know me to get you tickets to a, a fight? And I go, I kind of, I'd love to go to a fight in some ways because I, I think it's great and I, I have been to fights. Um, but, you know, smaller local deals. Hell, I've even been a judge at a local fight um, thanks to my uh, boxing coach and stuff like that. But um, this is the thing about it, guys, is that I love the sweet science and I love getting to see it in slow-mo. I love the different camera angles. I, I know you can see that on the big screen, but I really like to have a bird's eye view and you really see how it comes together. You know what I mean? And it's um it's like this. It's like um would I have I mean what what place could I be when while Bob Ross is painting that would be a better view where I wouldn't be physically standing in his way? <laughs> it's like it's not possible, man. And so yeah, I'm I'm absolutely um I absolutely love this this experience of putting you guys you know, right in front of the camera where you can see this stuff come together because what this turns into is something that is just imagination completely unchained. I mean, you've got the Necronomicon, you've got 
the sword that Nosferu uses that's kind of born of this evil world. You've got this kind of eldritch horror that's coming through and creating, uh, and is a part of a ritual that this person makes himself the first vampire. You have got a sexy and beautiful mummy that is going to be responsible for carrying in this sort of undead, dead way, this abomination that is going to be uh, one of our big bosses and one of our big baddies in this Nosferu book. I mean, it's all right here, man. It's all right here. And and that's it. Yeah, it's um, yeah, th it's never going to happen when it comes to them, man. It's never going to happen. Um, I think digital comic book art is a little lifeless. You have to be really good at it to make it look like traditional on-paper comic art. Yeah, I think, um, I was thinking about that, too. Um, hold on a second. Dana stripped uh, Francis the other day. Oh, it's too bad. I was really looking forward to him and John Jones. Yeah, um, Francis Ngano, um has put someone's head into orbit. So uh, it's, I'd love to see that, man. I'd absolutely love to see that. Yeah, it's, it, you too. What are you going to do, man? I mean, that's the thing about it, isn't it? We're always kind of, uh, we're always, time is not on our side, but work ethic is. And I, here's what I'd say about digital artwork. There is a lot of digital artwork that I do enjoy. And I, I really, like, it's, I, I don't, uh, I like to make stuff uh, digitally as well. Um, I use Photoshop every single day. I don't use Illustrator as much, but digital is always a part of what I'm doing. Always. And the digital stuff that I see, I actually tend to like it because it's digital, if that makes sense. Like, I, I kind of like it because it, it's leaning into what it is. So there's an artist uh, by the name of uh, Laurent Durot who does Adobe Illustrator vector-based movie posters. And that dude is a monster. Like, I don't want to see him work in traditional. His stuff is insane in digital. It's so good. And it's like screen prints. It's amazing. Yeah. That's right. Get what you pay for. Uh, and if it's free, yeah, you're absolutely right, man. Absolutely right. Yeah, guys, check out Rini and check out uh, Rini Draws YouTube and the comic book Fiendish comic book issue two is out there. Absolutely right. We're dropping Rini links. Um, let me see here. Um, I know many love digital art or its speed, but it has none of the texture, personal style, or organics of traditional work. I really hope AI art doesn't kill off artists. I won't. Don't worry about it. Um, AI art is not a threat to artists. I'll tell you why. Um, because um, AI art is not playing to AI's strength, and that has been the biggest obstacle of digital media since its inception, is that, um, how do I put it? The things that digital often adds to make it feel more human are things, are artifacts that bad artists often use to mask flaws in their ability, if that makes sense. It's, it does the same problem. It uses style the same way bad artists do. And when digital artwork is on it, it's, it's got a higher bar, but it's perfection. It's perfect at what it's doing. And so I always tell people that... Um, Digital artwork success is is in some ways very much the same as traditional. It's no, it's choosing the. You never want to choose a media because it's easier. You always want to choose a media because it is able to get you where you want to be going the most effectively. So when people talk to me about um, people talk to me about painting um, oil paints or sorry painting digitally when it looks like an oil paint, I'm just like, why not use uh, you know, why not do an oil painting? Like, why, or why not just do a Photoshop piece or a clip art or clip studio piece or a illustrator piece? Why are you trying to force it to be something that it's not? It's not a bad thing in and of itself. And, um, I think that most people, most artists who are driven push themselves and the technology to its limits and they don't typically do it for ease. Uh, when I watched Michael Bancroft uh, working on the Eiffel Tower, I'm not sure it's working out for him in terms of ease. That guy is a machine. And hail, Passmaster Dan. I just saw you here in the chat. It is good to see you, my friend. Hello. And he says, hello to Bromanda. It is great to see you. Um, let's see who else we've got here. For example, oh, yes, I feel that Graham Nolan does a great job of drawing comics digitally. Yeah, Graham's a legend. And he's body shaming us all. You saw it. Uh, there are parts of art which is tedium for artists. AI can do those things. Yeah, it will never be the tool that, that causes artists their problems. It's going to be the skill again and again. And what changes in technology often do is they, um, 
they allow art or they put artists who have been resting on taking the easy way out they take away what they're doing and the more sophisticated people the tool does not affect nearly as much it just doesn't um it just takes away um it takes away the average and so i think that that's something i would i would absolutely say is is important for people to remember uh is that it's it's we've all seen come on guys we've all seen terrible digital artwork we've all seen the reason why you see more terrible digital artwork is because it's a now an easier tool to get ahead of or get a hold of but the other thing i would say about it is um before it was there was nothing no shortage of bad pen and ink artwork why because pens were more accessible than oil paint but there was still a ton of terrible oil paintings out there like i don't think bad art painted in oil is any less valuable or more valuable than uh bad artwork painted in digital that's just not the case it's it's got to be good man there's oh gosh say his name and he appears i praise you once you know mel is going to start making fun of our relationship dude my tools haven't changed since the original ginger root hand just the application of persistent effort see mel's gonna think there's like it, we're just giving credence to mel's accusations of our love michael if whenever i praise you you show up i mean come on man sorry i've got the maturity of a 12 year old well listen um you've got two years on me um I'm body shamed by Graham, but then my wife has a run marathon, has run a marathon, so my body shame is way of life. Amen. Yeah. Start making fun. Laugh out loud. Hey, postmaster Dan. We got my brother Michael Bancroft, uh, my brother from the other side of the planet. God bless him in the chat. But I mean, that's ultimately the thing. The people that that I think bring excellence to the table, and are enthusiastic and passionate about excellence, are always what builds any kind of living environment society group of people and that's what's so great about comics gate and long may it be so that you've got people like mrs and jetty my wife you've got people like mel you've got all of the people who are supporting us yanzi um andrea um faye You've got uh, so many creators out there, Shelly Lepresti, but you've got us as well. And then we've got you guys who know us and are supporting us and allowing us to do the stuff that we do because um, you're not stopping us from excellence. You're encouraging the excellence that we're trying to provide. And I always say this is that um, when I back a book, I don't think I'm the artist on the book. I think that's something that um, is absolutely insane that most comic skaters don't know about. Because you would have to be in the depths of academic insanity to know. But I'm going to share it with you guys right now. Um, because it's important. Because I want you guys to, to do research, look this stuff up, so you understand what they're doing. There is this phenomenon that happened in academia called reader response theory. It's a theory, right, that is very, very big right now. And the theory is this. It's so insane and narcissistic, it almost defies logic that the person reading the book because they're bringing the book to life which is an interesting way to talk look at it as opposed to the creator bringing it to life is an active participant in its authorship they're not a reader they're a co-creator this is really important because what they say is is that whatever the person wants to interpret it as they have a right to do so not as that's an opinion wrong or right there is no objective fact in the book because you're a co-author anything you misread is just as valid as what the author intended this is a huge problem this is a huge problem because one it disrespects the hard work that goes into it's like sort of like me saying by me driving the car i am the co-builder of the car which is madness absolute madness and so when I see people talking about this, like why do people come on to properties and projects and think that they, as someone who grew up with and were a fan of it, have just as much right to change the canon of the thing than um, the person who actually created it because they think that by being a fan of it, they were a co-creator. It is a real thing. And it is taught in colleges and it is backed up. It is like the next level of hell of postmodernism and communism so what you basically the reason it exists is for the reason all this crap exists which is to de uh delegitimize interestingly enough which is what they're obsessed with um 
they want to delegitimize the author so they can change it. They start with that thing. You can't they they you can't separate the author from the art began along those lines because it allows people to pirate, steal, take credit for and uh, separate creators of things from their property. It's about property theft, intellectual property theft, and also ultimately creative skill theft. And if you don't know what reader response theory is, you've got to look it up. Yeah, I started when I was 15. I was watching a tree hugger in those faces of death. Oh my God, scary. Um, that's taking a truish thing and making it crazy. Absolutely, absolutely. And you saw this with, um, I, we don't know. There are no knowns and there are unknown knowns. Um, yeah, speaking in code ticks me off. Uh, say it, I'll deal with it. Yeah, and that's, yeah, it is absolutely Marxist, postmodernist crap, sheeple hunter. And that is the thing I need people to sort of know. So when people are talking about why is it that people think that, um, how do I put this? Um, if I buy a piece of Star Wars merchandise or if somebody, you know, buys, you know, a piece of merchandise from a store... And that thing arrives broken or it's not, you know, it's it doesn't work. They have a right to complain about the product, right? And they have a right to return it and, and get a refund. You know, if you're buying you know, something at Target and it's broken or you're buying something on Amazon and it's broken, that's just the way that people think of their money, their property that they're exchanging uh, with something else, right? Well, but if you think when you buy a Star Wars product, that that gives you an, a, a, an equal say to, say, George Lucas in where the narrative goes, you're a narcissist. You've lost your mind. Do you know what I mean? Um, oh, let's see. No, I don't. It, it typically doesn't need it. Uh, and it also, I don't like, even with Workable, it, it just, it gives it a glare that doesn't reproduce as well. But that's a great nerd question. I just switched gears. Yeah. Bollocks to that sounds like typical acad. Yeah, it, it does. And this is the thing. Hey, from the Groovesman, my brother. We were just texting the other day over the passing of uh, the late, great Jason Pearson. Brother, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for, uh, yeah, for sharing that, man. Because that was that was rough, dude, you know, to, to be able to talk to you about it and know that you knew what I was talking about. But this is the thing about it, right? You are not the creator of a thing. because You are not the author of a work because you read it. You're not the author of a work because you're a fan of it. That's not how creativity works. If you don't believe me, look at what Amazon did with Rings of Power. Okay? You can't mistake yourself as a reader for the creator of the thing. And by the way, that's great. I like to take plane trips. I don't want to be the freaking pilot. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like whatever happened to enjoying being entertained without needing to control the entertainment. Shoot, I know people who are hardcore gamers who don't try to control the game when they're playing. Do you know what I mean? As much as people try to control what, you know, a particular property says and what its messaging is, it's like, entertain me and make other entertainment that competes with it, and you're going to get excellence. And so, yeah, I think that that's the biggest, um, that's the biggest thing missing. Um, here's the problem with people outside of academia, and this is something that I know having been in it what academia is pushing now will be impact will impact people um, four or five years later or they'll start to hear bits of it. What you guys have with me when I'm talking about this stuff is I'm I know people who are active in it. I was active in you know in terms of teaching art. I wasn't a part of this you know critical bullshit. But this is the thing people need to understand, man. It's huge. Is that you have to understand education used to be about teaching skills. It's not anymore. Now it's about teaching Marxism and ideology. And if you don't understand, and it's reader read response theory is pretty, it, it's recent, but it's like five or six years old. It's not, they're never going to say that's what we're doing, but they're going to act that way. Yeah, the, the message used to be, yeah, a moral application. Yeah. And so I want to make sure that, that I'm explaining this stuff to you guys so you understand that you should be saying, um, how do I put this? You should always be aware when you're working on something and making artwork on something that isn't yours, that you don't own it, and that that creator is the person who owns it and made it. That is something that a lot of people have had eroded in their minds. Like, what is ownership? Well, it's the fruits of somebody's labor and their mind. What I'm doing right here is the fruit of my labor, my mind, and decades of skill. 
And it's something that I always tell people. It is, it would be insane for me to expect somebody to benefit from it without paying from it, for it. That's theft. That's looting. And that is something Ayn Rand talked about really beautifully in Atlas Shrugged, is the looters and, uh, and people who think that they can just sort of take things. And the looters have a lot of different ways of working. But the biggest one is, and the most insidious one, is thinking that the person who owns the thing has no right to the thing. That's what you do when you steal stuff. That's what you do whenever you do anything like that. And you're saying, this person has this, but I should have it, and it doesn't matter that they've what they've put into it, what they've bought it with, their capital. No. And when you guys back this book, and I'm putting these things together, you are its destination. You are where it's going. You know, that is the goal. And this is a crowdfund. This isn't even a pre-order, for God's sake. And that's the way I think about this kind of stuff. But it's a very strange thing when someone has got a, a property or something they built, and they don't know this. You know what I mean? They, they just think, well, nope, this is mine. I get to have this. This is this is mine to take, to, to lift. And it's, it's a very, um, how do I word it? Um, the, f the weirdest thing about it is that the current people, the current crop of pseudo-intellectuals who've found themselves in these corporations have done a hell of a good job actually affirming to their low-level you know, employees and the creators who are working that this is in fact the case. In fact, they've cut their own legs out from under them by you know, essentially saying, no, it's like th this can be anything. Star Wars can be anything. Marvel Comics can be anything. Um, when something can be anything, it is by default nothing. Like Nosfero and the stories I tell with this book, if I didn't write them and I didn't illustrate them, they're not Nosfero stories. And hail to my brother and chicken. That sounds terrible, by the way. Black Rose Comics, B Rose, it's great to see you, brother. Living in the land of my birth. Um, John, the smoothing out comes from my reaction to the circumstances. You guys are killing me, man. You guys are great. Indeed, hail the chat. But do you know what I'm saying? So it's really important to me that you guys understand what this is. When you guys back things as customers, when you are supporters of something, that is a very valuable role. And the reason why it's it's the role that I play in this is um, is different and is um, is is uh, has to be regarded differently is very very simple. I'm assuming the majority of the risk. I'm assuming the majority of the risk in terms of the time, the commitment, the sacrifice, all of that stuff. And I, as I often say, um, the great thing about entertainment is not assuming the risk. Is that when someone else is doing the entertainment, it's you just get to sit back and enjoy it. And if it doesn't go well, they could lose your money and say, "I don't want to ever buy this again. This artwork is terrible. This thing is awful." Right? That is that's what purchasing power is. Unless of course people are addicted to brands. Um, but you don't have to have that worry as a, someone buying Star Wars. You don't have to worry about if you make a movie that nobody wants to see if you're George Lucas. Um, so you become the custodian of it when you purchase intellectual properties. And these custodians never thought George Lucas um, had anything to do with Star Wars. You, you talk to people. People are like going, Star Wars is so great except for George Lucas. And you're like, I'm sorry, hang on. I love Harry Potter, but, you know, it'd be so much better without J.K. Rowling. How exactly would that work? It's a very weird thing. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, it's like saying, um, yeah, it's, it's like, you know, if you get rid of the person who originates and makes the work, you don't have it. Can you, um, do you have to like them personally? No, but you do have to give credit where credit's due. And that is the craziest thing that we don't do here. We give credit where it's due. We absolutely do. We say, hail to the chat. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. We do this as a matter of, frankly, to me, it's just freaking manners 101. Like, why would you want to just be a tool? Um, there's a quote for the ages. Um, but it's 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 bigger than that. It's bigger than that. It's um, why would anybody want to take credit for somebody else's work or ignore somebody's um, role in making their own work. And I used to say this when I when I taught because I was not one of those insane teachers. I would say, I am here to try to help you guys in a way that your parents can't because they're hiring me to do so. 
but I am not here to ignore the 18 plus years of sacrifice they put into you before you got here. Do you get what I'm saying? I'm not here to undo their work, you know? And that is something that some college teachers are playing parent and they need to get, get away from that. And I don't mean in a supportive way. I mean in an engineering their minds way. Denny O'Neill said he was shocked by the response to the death of Robin. He said um, that, uh, that I'm not a writer, editor, churning out fiction, but the custodian of a piece of our national folklore. God, Godspeed, Denny O'Neill, and rest in peace, my friend. Yes, I, I agreed, and, and I've heard him talk very eloquently about comics. So do me this, um, do me this uh, favor, really, um, for us and for what we're trying to do here. Understand reader response theory. Understand how insane it is, and realize that it has affected the entire... It is basically a retroactive intellectual justification for legitimizing fan fiction to an equal level of the real artwork. When people say this mainstream stuff seems like bad fan fiction, it's because the intellectual justification for fan fiction being equally legitimate, which is what these people have desperately wanted for years, being just as legitimate as the original author's in work, is that um, it's, it was something that they already believed, and when they got into academic circles, they tried to create a essentially a a abstract theory slash putting it into law that that is the case and it is purely marxist based it is straight up marxist based take away ownership of individual work ethic you know property intellectual and physical and it's nuts they encourage theft because they say who are you to own it it's that simple and it's really weird um, I, uh, why I hate the latest societal push to erase them. Yes, they would love to erase the Founding Fathers and say, hey, it doesn't matter who created this, amen. It doesn't matter, like, the history. They, they, they hate all of that stuff. Impressionable. Um, uh, and the movies showed real... F yes, uh, I know the one you're talking about. Yes, indeed. Yeah, it's, it's really... Yeah, it's rough. <laughs> um, I was tricked into... Yes, I, I have... I had that... Uh, I've had that experience myself. Yes, Jeremy Burtz, channel member Jeremy Burtz in the chat. It is great to see you, Jeremy Burtz. I hope you are doing well, my friend. Hail to you. Um, always great to see you guys. And please, you know, thank you for hitting like and subscribing to this channel. And if you haven't yet, please do. I know a lot of you guys have. I know most of you guys probably have. Um, but yeah, we're talking about we're talking about art. We're painting. We're I'm showing the uh, the creation of this book. But w oddly, as you know, happens in all uh, fun conversations and great conversations that you have with friends. Um, this, this insidious theory of reader response, um, theory has come up into the conversation and it is, um, if you've missed this conversation, go back and check it out. But guys, this, this, um, we should be bringing this up as an evil poison as much as we are with CRT and as much as we are with, uh, um, DIE as I like to call it, but DEI reader response theory is a rejection of ownership of the things that you create for all intents and purposes. It is a devaluing of creative authors, authors of creative work. And it tells people that they should be able to have things for free. It tells people that they should be able to have sway and power over somebody else's individual expression. And it is why they have worked so darn hard to separate the creators of some of the most important pop culture and folklore works in America from their creators. Because if they can separate it from their creators, then they're beholden to no one and they can destroy the things that you value. And remember that, that the first step is for them to tell you something that is a very pleasant fiction. You know, it is a pleasant fiction. Hey, you're just as responsible for Star Wars' success as George Lucas is. Well, let's remove George Lucas from Star Wars. How's it doing? Um, that's what their objective is. That's what their objective is. You are not. I am not. We can disagree with any aspect of those movies, but that is patently false and it's insane and self-obsessed, if that makes sense. Um, and that's the thing that I would tell anybody. Understand that's some reader response theory stuff. You've seen people trying to say to Eric July, I wouldn't have done this. Yes, you would have maybe changed this one panel here. And I hope Eric July sees this. Maybe you change this panel here. But what Eric July I don't think has ever um, heard, probably because he doesn't move in insane circles, is 
this is a part of reader response theory. I'm not doing 99.9% .9 of the work. I'm just picking a few things out of it and saying, uh, you have to take for granted I would have created all of that other stuff. Take for granted I would have created all that other stuff and done this thing differently. Insane. You know, it's like putting gas in your car and saying, well, I would have, you know, or someone putting gas in your car, which I can't imagine, but someone else putting gas in your car and saying, um, taking credit or someone building a car, putting gas in it and saying, you know, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have painted the car that color, um, but I could have built the whole car. Take me, take that on faith. And that's really important for us to understand, man. That's really important for, because it is a, if we attack their, um, their theories that underlie everything and reveal them as the postmodernist Marxist theft that they are, then they, they're, first of all, it puts them on their, their heels because they'll go, how did you hear about that? Because they, they, they talk about, they express their values, but they hide the theory and the terminology. That's why when people, we start using their terms, they immediately disavow them. It's the thing they're most afraid of is their own terms being called out. I don't see a join nor buy gift membership option. Sean, fix this, please. Um, there should be a join. Is there a join membership option? There isn't? I thought there was one. I know some people have gifted memberships, but oh, dear heavens. Um, is that the case, Jim Cox? Let me know. Take a look. And hail to Jim Cox, by the way. Um, they thought Albert Einstein was insane at first, too. Glad he didn't cave to society's level of understanding. Yeah, I need smarter people. I need doctors and surgeons who know things. When I when I got appendicitis, the people who saved me, I didn't say I collaborated in my surgery. Oh, might be an I iOS problem. Understood, Jim Cox. Understood. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, well, thank you for, for asking, and thank you for even considering it, brother. I appreciate it. But, but I need us to understand that when we attack their terminology, that's what they're afraid of. They're afraid of being called out because their ideas, when you name them, the, just it, they attack, how I word this, they attack the reputations of people by name. But the thing they're most sensitive is not being attacked by whatever fake name they're using or even their own fake names. They're afraid of having their, their um, toxic ideology attacked by name. And if we keep hammering home and attacking reader response theory, reader response theory, DEI, if we attack their uh, sacred acronyms, that's when they get frightened. Attack them in their acronyms. Attack them in their completely poisonous acronyms. Like the acronym they had for a National Socialist Party, which they um, remove the, the, the full explanation of what it stands for. They hide behind acronyms because if you say the acronym out loud, it reveals what side they're on. And it's crazy. They're trying to drop the word woke so bad right now. Haven't we revealed what their what their weakness is? Attack woke and start attacking. First, understand what reader response theory is. And believe me, they love to define their terms. So that's their biggest weakness. They have to have you know how insane what they're thinking is. The problem is when you don't know the terms, you don't know where to look them up and you don't know how to take them down. So yeah, that's a big thing. So is this the reason they've turned against uh, J.K. Rowling? You've got it, because she is um, very much still owns everything Harry Potter, and they can't take control of it. Well, let me ask you a question, my friend. You're asking me this. Is this why? I will absolutely, you will have my respect. I will doff my cap to you. If anyone can tell me what was the first skirmish in trying to, um, in trying to, um, um, put out there that you should be able to earn money from J.K. Rowling's labor without paying her. It's It goes back very far. What was the first skirmish where J.K. Rowling stood up and said, no, you don't get to do this. I own this. And that's what started this resentment. Somebody let me know. If you can come up with it, I, I want to hear it. Because I remember it like it was yesterday, largely because of, you know, where I live on the spectrum, but also, um, you know, for other reasons. Uh, as well. So let me see if anybody in the chat can get this, because this is another thing. Um, we're very good at remembering stuff that happens and keeping track of things because they change stuff so quickly and we're more effective. That's why when you see Razor Fist take somebody or something to task, it's his encyclopedic knowledge and his great memory and his ability of metacognition to connect things. I have a similar capacity. It's why I'm able to, to walk and chew gum why well, I'm able to paint and create and discuss complicated bullshit postmodernist Marxist crap. Um, total guess, Quidditch, that was close. That was close, but it was before that. It was before that. Ah, ski school. Um, 
those who control the language are absolutely right. Does I'm going to give it to you guys in five seconds. Or I, let me rephrase that. I'm going to tell you the answer in five seconds. Everybody, you're safe. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to tell you what the answer is in five seconds. Four, three, two, one. There was a website called Pottermore, I believe. I think. Look it up. That tried to sell a book collecting all of their information on how everything in Harry Potter worked. They wanted to produce an encyclopedia of Harry Potter stuff, but they said was the Pottermore website's uh, published book about what their fan stuff was. And J.K. Rowling goes, I'm the person, you're taking what I created and you're putting it on a website and you're putting it together. The second you start trying to monetize, I created the things. Just because you, I might put out, well, I'm obviously going to put out a book and have the right to make money off of, this is the world of Harry Potter, here's your encyclopedia. That was the thing that they did that absolutely, Mrs. and Jenny has entered the room, the beautiful Mrs. and Jenny. That was the thing that they did that they used to take everything right. Pottermore, uh, trademark 2023, Jonathan Jenny. You're absolutely right. So they were trying to make and publish a book. You want to talk about somebody's wheelhouse. They were trying to publish a book on Harry Potter without paying J.K. Rowling, saying, but it's from our website. We collected all of this. And this goes back, So, if someone can get me the, the year, um, let me know. Uh, <laughs> hey, BME, beautiful Mrs. and Jetty. I love it. Thank you, guys. I love that. Tell them I could use that. Oh, Mrs. and Jetty said she could use that. She's having a bit of a tough day, guys. You know, she's having a bit of tough uh, a tough day. If you guys send a lot of super chats, I'll, send, I'll take her out to dinner. Um, but let me say this and hail Jeremy Burt's channel member, Jeremy Burt's. Let me, let me, I want to look this up, um, just to make sure I have it. Um, or, okay. Let's see here. Legal dispute over Harry Potter series. Uh, let's see here by JK Rowling, the subject of the, da, 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 da. um, allegations of copyright and trademark infringement against her. Of course, that's going to be on Wikipedia first. Um, but let me just see if international publications, other accusations of infringement. See, it's this is a great thing. You go to Wikipedia, and they're all about things that she has done. Legal injunctions are separate. Um, but there was, if someone could find me the, the date of it, there was a time when they were going to publish this book, and she sued to stop them from doing it. They said, you can't make money doing this. Yes, but we want some of that sweet revenue stream. And by the way, you'll notice when she flexes, J.K. Rowling goes, Whenever I feel sad about the way people think about me, I just look at those giant royalty checks and I sleep like a baby. She has asserted her right to own the things she creates. That is her crime. That is her crime. Um, oh, beautiful M, Mrs. and Jetty. Absolutely right. We love Mrs. and Jetty. Oh, you guys are so great. She says thank you, guys. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Anne Rice had a similar encounters with fan fiction. Fan fiction was the birth of reader response theory. Everybody's saying hello to you, Mrs. and Jetty. Lots of love for you in the thank chat, you. guys. I can feel it. Aw, she says thank you. She can feel it, guys. Oh, you guys are the best. So this is the thing about it, though, and I want you guys to think about this. Um, fan fiction in its online form is goes back so far that it has given enough time for postmodernist Marxist-educated students to formulate a theory of ownership of fan fiction. You wish it was it was starting at Marxism, but Marxism is serving resentment. And the ability to monetize somebody else's work is what it is. It's so bizarre. Uh, um, the groomsman, who I think you know who that is, his name starts with an R, uh, says, um, hello to you, by the way. He says, hey, what's up, oh, Lauren? Hey, Rocky. Hey, Rocky. Sorry. That's okay. Don't worry. He'll be fine. He'll survive. No one will know how to spell it. Um, <laughs> don't worry at all. Um, I'm back, says Phil. It's great to see you. So here's the thing I need you guys to understand. If you want to understand your history, fan fiction has always been a part of pop culture. It's always been. People have written their Batman stories. They've done all this stuff. What has changed is that people never presumed ownership, and they never presumed that they would have the ability to make money off of it do you understand they never thought oh i'm gonna make a harry potter book and i'm gonna sell it i'm going to make you know a marvel comics t-shirt but i'm gonna sell it now it is great 
Um, or let's say this, I'm going to take the Comics Gate trademark, which I don't own and haven't used for trade, and try to take it over even though I've done nothing to make it. That is why our laws... Yeah, you've got it. That's absolutely how it's spelled. <laughs> August 2016 is the date I'm seeing for Pottermore um, to be released uh, in September 2016. Gotcha. Yeah. And so this is the thing I want you to understand. They Why, if they hate Comics Gate and they think it's an awful thing, would anybody do do think about this intellectually would anybody want to trademark it it wasn't just to run it into the ground i mean that'd be part of it but it was about taking something you didn't create that has value to a community of people who will buy it to a customer base let's not say community to a customer base why not take something like that and copyright it and own it it is intellectual theft and that is why the courts we're able to see, long may these people not be, huh, they're going to be there soon anyway, uh, but that's why we have a responsibility to know what we're dealing with. But they were trying to steal something of value. They wouldn't have stolen it if they didn't think it had value. So they attack something of value until they can steal it. Or they attack a person who creates something of value, uh, like George Lucas, until they're so tired of the attack that they want to sell it and be done with it. And then they win. And so it really is, um, when we talk about, let's talk about this. What are they trying to take from us right now, guys? I'm getting fired up, guys. What are they trying to take from us right now? What are they trying to take from a friend of ours right now? Let's say that, because it's not we're not the communists. They're trying to take Mike Barron's reputation. You know why? Because it has value. It has value to him, and it also is something that we take great pride in the fact that he is such an amazing creator. That's what they're coming after right now. And that's why we were posting the link to his GoFundMe earlier. They're calling a man who my earliest memories of him was him writing in Punisher issue number 17. Um, some of the best characters ever that happened to be diverse. I didn't even know who they were. I didn't even know their race. I knew their characters. I never identified them based on that. Um, but he wrote some of the best characters of all stripes. And that is exactly what he's doing in his independent work. And what are they coming for? They're coming for his reputation. Why? Because if they can hold his head down underwater, they think they'll stop drowning. That's what that's about. Are you guys going to let that happen? Are you guys going to let them do that to Mike? Are you going to let them do that to me? Are you going to let them do that to Ethan? Are you going to let them do that to anybody? Are you going to let them do that to Rich Ayala? Are you going to let them do that to all of the creators in this space? No. They don't get to come for what's ours. No Sparrow the Crypt Walker is mine. I work hard. It is it belongs to me, my family, and all of the effort we put into it. And we thank you for that, right? But this is this is what we do here. We believe in that because if you guys can take care of me, that's the only way I can afford to do this, right? Is by the exchange of goods. You your money is valuable to me because I know you worked hard for it. Do you understand? You guys Use your money to buy this because you know I worked hard for this and that my time has value, just like I think your time has value. You know what Ayn Rand said were the most important people to realize and the most important thing to be in a society was a trader, T-R-A-D-E-R, -E that you trade your work, your time, and the things that you gain through hard work and honest labor with another person over things that you both believe that you have that and that has value to me, makes my life better, and I have this that makes your life better. It's a fair trade. And that is what it's about, man. That's what it's about. Um, and I think about this stuff all of the time when I'm doing this kind of work. And Crenshaw Fowl, welcome, my friend. Welcome. It is great to see you. Um, but that's that's the thing that I think about. Yes, we value life. And the, the number one property that you have, the number one thing you have to be able to say you own or else everything else you own doesn't matter, is your own life and your ability to to own your life is is paramount to everything that we do here. And so when I look at the stuff that I'm doing with No Sparrow, and this is an aspirational book that really does deal with, not in a didactic way, but it affirms these things, this stuff is important. This stuff that we're talking about is important. So understand that reader response theory, which they paint as some intellectual thing, goes back to and what their attack on J.K. Rowling and the idea that, well, Harry Potter is just as much ours as it is hers. No, it is not. No, it is not. I am a customer on occasion of Harry Potter. My family are customers of it. We are not creators of it because we're not insane. 
Indeed, viva la liberté. Absolutely. I just ate ramen and I'm better. Listen, side note, I love ramen. Uh, <laughs> unrelated. Um, consenting noodles are none of my business. You're absolutely right. Viva la pizza. I feel like it should have been something like viva la, la champagne. Uh, liberty equals individual. You're absolutely right, guys. And so um, that's what why I think it's so important to keep streaming and putting this stuff out there. But I'm going to say this term over and over and over and again until you get it. Reader, and I'm going to define it for what it is, and you can look up and, um, you know, put holes in the bullshit that they say that it actually is, right? Poke holes in that, that silliness, which is reader response theory is an intellectualization that came from the presence of, um, of people who grew up creating fan fiction and thinking that they had a right to profit off of it when they learned how copyright laws work. And it was an intellectual justification for um, stealing and theft of other people's intellectual property and the use of their resources and their creativity. Theft of it for your own use. That's what it is. And so what I need people to do is say, this is, uh, call it out for what it is. That it is about, it's not about fan fiction making it onto the big screen. It's the belief that authors don't own their work, that you don't earn your labor, that if you guys go to work all day and you put you you th th and I say, well, the money you have, you didn't really spend on Nosfero because technically it's not your money. Can you imagine how you would feel if I thought that? No, I define it as I am giving you my labor for your money. It's not ethereal. It's freaking insane. Um, Ray Haylock, uh, Tug's web guy, hail panel and chat, hail to you, my friend, it's great to see you, much love, and much respect, and by Tug's web guy, were you, are you referring to that umbrella guy, my friend, is that who you're referring to, because I have a cool piece of artwork I can show you, if I can, if I can find it, God help me, but let me know, um, but yeah, man, I mean, this is the stuff that people need to understand, and the way they do it, oh yeah, excellent, there you go, um, Tug's seen this, uh, I think he posted online way back in the day, so it goes back a little ways. But here is a painting I did, uh, and I sent the image to Tug not long ago. So here you go. And I this may have been one of the first times um, someone had illustrated uh, that umbrella guy with a uh, bowler cap. Because I was thinking uh, that that umbrella guy made me think of the Avengers. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you get a kick out of it if you haven't seen it before. Um, but, uh, but this is the thing, right? I go back, way back to a lot of that stuff. And I think, oh, thank you. Ray, I appreciate that. Much love, brother. Much love. Um, but it's it's one of those things to where when we do this stuff, uh, thank you, Sean. This stream actually helped because I've always felt fan fiction, especially the shippers, have started to gain too much control in the last decade. Well, here's the funny thing about it, and here's the problem, right? If you decentralize, um, if, if you can decentralize and take away that stuff, what you're doing is, and what, what the, the sad... Um, aspect of narcissistic fan fiction as opposed to being an actual fan because they don't consider themselves fans they consider themselves co-authors is you are willing to sabotage and redefine something for your own personal pleasure at the expense of everyone else's pleasure do you understand it's and what a creator has to do is a creator has to create something that is inspiring that works that they're able to accomplish but it is by by design to give the most enjoyment to the most people. Fan fiction is the inversion of that. Fan fiction is about, I want my own needs to be met regardless of how many other people it makes miserable. And they're not content to have it be their fan fiction. They want you to have to accept it as truth at the expense of your own imagination. And isn't that sad? Because when we're kids and we're drawing and we're making artwork, when I was doing Star Wars drawings as a kid, that is a wonderful, innocent thing that you do. You imagine inside of someone else's universe. You say, what if I was Luke Skywalker? What if I was Han Solo? What if I was a Jedi? But what you don't do is you don't go up to somebody and you don't say, that's not how Jedi work, even though it's been defined over here. That is a bully in this little play group. And it is a play group of children. And I think it's so important for us to understand that. It's so important for us to understand that going forward. And I want you guys to be thinking about um, that phrase. And I want us to just hammer the hell out of that phrase and say, you're just somebody, Amanda B. Ugh, I know. I, I'm with you, Amanda B. I know. 
Um, <laughs> oh dear. Yes. Uh, look guys, this is the way it is. Uh, <laughs> guys are absolutely killing me, man. Guys, the chat death by a thousand jokes. Um, there was a contest where someone could design, um, a new enemy for, you're going to have to help me. I, I know what it is, but I can't get it. Um, he, oh, Hero Hey was mad because the creator received no compensation or copyright for it. Yep, that is how it works. Yes, amen to that indeed. You guys are absolutely right. I God, I love the chat, man. The chat's beautiful. Um, but listen, guys, um, I'm going to go um, and spend some time with the family. Uh, we've been two hours. We're doing good. Two streams in two days. Let's. I'm going to keep this going, guys. Keep me honest. Oh, Ruby, got you. Got you. Makes total sense, guys. And thank you guys for being here. Oh my gosh, almost to 40 likes. Are you kidding me? That's uh, wonderful, guys. You guys are awesome. Um, but this is the thing, too, is that what we got to make sure we're doing here is we got to be making sure that we know the nature of the disease that we're treating. And the disease is resentment. And whatever labels it gets, it's still a virus. It's it's it, That's what it is. Whatever illness it is, is still... You know, we have to understand what it is because you don't want to treat somebody for everything. As I often say, you can medicate any pain with morphine, but it's not going to solve the problem. And if we tell ourselves that this is not the pathetic pseudo-intellectualization of resentment, and this is an attempt at theft by looters and an attempt to um, take away the power of people trading value, we are traders we give money for services, goods for services. That is what we, goods, you know, everything. We do all of this stuff because we have value here. Um, we have to separate ourselves from that, guys. Uh, and, and we have to tell them what they are. They're thieves and they're resentful thieves. And we're going to do great stuff here. So as always, guys, um, I've got to actually hang on a second. I'm not going to wrap up just yet because I have to do something real quick. And it's going to be ugly, but I want you guys to, uh, I want you guys to watch it happen. So I'm going to add, I don't know if you guys can still hear me. Good, you can still hear me. I'm going to add something to this. Actually, oh, I can't do that on stream. This is annoying. All right, hold on a second. I'm going to have to do this later, unfortunately. Where is the main theme here? Oh, there it is. Where is it? Um, let me do, ah, I want to do this so bad, but I can't. I want to, um, I always want to, can you hear me now? I always want to um, do this, but I didn't have a chance. So Improbi, if you're out there, I want to give you special thanks for becoming a channel member. I was going to try um, to to add to this um, the Improbi into the credits. I built the credits, but I haven't um, I haven't been able to put them into the stream because that's the way that Ecamm works. So and hail to you, Michael Bancroft, my brother from Australia. I love you, man, and thank you for all of your support. Um, and and this is the thing. Um, uh, but I, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to update the credits before this show um, for channel member and probably, but I do have them. I just can't put them in live on stream. It's just the way Ecamm is set up. But I will talk to you guys soon. Hail and respect a new channel member and probably I will have that sorted by the next stream. And thank all of you guys who are channel members and seeing the stuff that I'm sharing over there, all of the cool artwork. You guys are the best. Um, much love to all of you guys. I will see you soon. Um, here are the credits, guys. And uh, peace. And stay gold. Dedication.